Vatikánem, Vátrštěmi, vytáje tu a particular verse from Shiva Bhagavatam, that is the 28th verse of the 30th chapter of the 10th canto of Shiva Bhagavatam. The verse has been written on the board. Uh, I hope everyone can see that, the writing. Can the one from the last row see? Vishwadeva Prabhu, can you read it? Yes, you can read it. <coughs> so, this verse describes the identity of Srimati Radharani and Srimati That's why we decided to discuss this verse. Anaya Radhito Anaya Radhito Nunam Nunam Bhagavan Certainly. 
Bhagavan, Bhagavan, the personality of Godhead, the personality of Godhead. Hari, Hari, Lord Krishna, Lord Krishna, Ishwara, Ishwara, the Supreme Controller, the Supreme Controller, Yat, Yat, in as much as, in as much as, Na, Na, As, As, Bihaya, Bihaya, rejecting, rejecting. Govinda, Govinda, Lord Govinda, Lord Govinda, Pritaha, Pritaha, please, please, Yam, Yam, Khum, Khum, Anayat, Anayat, Le, Le, Raha, Raha, to a secluded place. To a secluded place. <coughs> Translation. Certainly, this particular gopi has perfectly worshipped the all-powerful personality of Godhead Govinda. Since he was so pleased with her that he abandoned the rest of us and brought us to a secluded place. Please repeat after me. Certainly this particular gopi has perfectly worshipped the all-powerful personality of Godhead. Since he was so pleased with her, since since he was so pleased with her, her that he abandoned the rest of us, and brought her to a secluded place, purport by actually these purports have been compiled by a group of devotees headed by his holiness Vidalman Maharaj. Srila yeah. yeah. Vishwana Chakravarti explains that the word Aradhitaha refers to Srimati Raghavani. He comments, the sage Sukhdev Goswami has tried with all endeavor to keep her name hidden, but now it automatically shines forth from the moon of his mind. That is spoken, her name is indeed her mercy. And thus the word Arashtara is like the rumbling of a cattle drum sounded to announce a great good fortune. Although the gopis spoke as if jealous of Srimati Radharani, they were actually excited to see that she had captured Sri Krishna. Srila Vishwana Chakravarti quotes the following detailed description of Srimati Radharani's footprints as given by Srila Rupa Goswami in his Sri Ujjala Nilamani. Quote, at the base of the large toe of her left foot is the mark of a barley corn. Below that mark is a disc. Below the disc is an umbrella and below the umbrella the bracelet. A vertical line extends. A vertical line extends from the middle of her foot to the juncture of her large and second toes. At the base of the middle toe is a lotus. Below that is a flag with a banner, and below the flag is a creeper together with a flower. At the base of a small toe is an elephant gourd and upon her hill is a half moon. Thus, there are eleven marks on her left foot. At the base of the large toe of her right foot is a conch shell, and below that is a spear. At the, base of the at the base of the small toe of her right foot is a sacrificial altar. Below that, an earring, and below the earring, a spear. Along the base of the second, third, fourth, and small toes is the mark of a mountain, below which is a chariot, and on the hill is a fish. Thus, altogether, there are 19 distinguishing marks on the souls of Srimati Rathalandi's lotus feet. <coughs> Om of Yana Timiranthasya. Jnana Jnana Shalakaya Chakshurun Vilitam Jena 
तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः श्री चैतन्य मनोविष्णु स्थापितं जेनम उदरे स्वयं रूपा कला मनिन तदाति स्वपदंतिकं वन्दे हम श्री गुरो श्री युत पद कमलं श्री गुरु वैष्णवस्य श्री रूपं सागर जातं सहगण They are not fully spiritualized as yet, but by being born in the Kaurav family, where Krishna's pastimes was going on in this planet, they got a chance to become perfect in their <coughs> sadhana. And when their husbands locked them up, 
select their bodies, which actually indicate that whatever material attachment or whatever material inability was there in them, they gave that up and achieved their spiritual perfection and attained their spiritual body. So in this way, all the gopis, the young gopis of Vrindavan, met with Krishna in the forest of Vrindavan. And then Krishna performed his rasa dance with them. Krishna danced with all the And in their dance, there were 16,000 gopis and Krishna extended himself also in 16,000 forms to dance with all the gopis. But in the center, there was one Krishna dancing with one gopi. So that gopi must be very, very special. So although Sukhari Goswami is describing that, but still he is not mentioning the name of the gopi. Who is that gopi in the center? Shubhya Goswami refrained from uttering the name. Sukhdev Goswami was hesitating to utter her name. Why? Because her identity is a great secret. But in this particular verse, Sukhdev Goswami could not help but give out her name. So when they were dancing in the Rasa dance, Krishna dancing with the gopi, at one point this particular gopi with whom Krishna was dancing in the middle of the circle, she decided to leave the Rasa dance. And when she left the Rasa dance, Krishna also followed her, leaving behind all the 16,000 gopis. So she must be very special. She must be more special than all the 16,000 gopis. But still, Sukhara Goswami didn't mention her name. Then, all the gopis all of a sudden found that Krishna has left. All this while, they were thinking that Krishna was dancing with them. All 16,000 gopis were thinking that Krishna was with them. Because Krishna expanded himself into that 16,000 form that Krishna was dancing with them. Now, is it difficult for Krishna? No. If Krishna can be with everyone in his heart, that's the Sutta Soul. Can Krishna not dance with everyone in Rasa? But when this particular gopi left the Rasa Mandali, then Krishna left the Rasa Mandali, following her. And these gopis, they were completely perturbed. They were, all of a sudden in the middle of the night, they found themselves alone in the middle of the forest, in the forest of Vrindavan, without Krishna. So they became like mad. And they started to look for Krishna everywhere. And they found Krishna's footprints. And Next to that foot footprint of footprints of Krishna, they found there was another set of footprints. And they could recognize whose footprint was that. Because in the, on the footprint, they could see the marks 
or different auspicious signs. And <clears throat> then they started to uh, follow that footprint with a desire to find Krishna. And then, then at one point they found that the footprint of that other girl was not there. It was only Krishna's footprint. Then they considered that at that point Krishna picked up, picked up that gopi on his back and carried her because she became tired. And then uh, they found that gopi alone in the forest because Krishna left her off. So, in, uh, in this way, Krishna performed his path, was performing his pastimes with the gopis in Vrindavan. So here, Sukhavya Goswami is describing who is that gopi. He is saying, Anaya Radhito. Anaya Aradhito. Aradhana means worship. And Anaya Radhito means one who is the best in worshipping Krishna. And from this word Aradhana came the name Radha. Radha means one who is best in worshipping Krishna. One who is able to please Krishna the most through her devotion. And who is that? That is Srimati Radharani. Srimati Radharani's birth day is today. Now what is this birth day of Srimati Actually, what to speak of Krishna, what to speak of Srimati Radharani. We know that even the living entities are eternal. In the spiritual sky, there is no birth and no death for the spirits. Na jayate mriyateva kadachi. A living entity is never born, nor will a living entity ever die. So if an ordinary living entity is never born and never dies, then where is the question of Srimati Radharani being born? The eternal concert of Krishna taking birth. Or even Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, taking birth. This we have to understand is the pastimes of the Lord along with his devotees. Krishna is unborn. But in order to perform his pastimes, Krishna comes down to this earth. And he takes birth as an ordinary human child. And that also he takes his birth in a very wonderful way. He takes his birth not in a palace, but in a prison. Even an ordinary human being is born with so much care and attention. But Krishna was born in the prison house of Kamsa. So in this way we can see Krishna not only takes birth, but he takes birth in a very special way. He takes birth in such a way that makes even the hardest heart melt with love and affection. Or here it melts with pathos, with painful feeling, which actually invokes the love for Krishna. So just as Krishna took birth, in order to participate in Krishna's uh, 
Vrindavan pastime, Srimati Rajarani also did God. And <clears throat> Srila Rupa Goswami described Srimati Rajarani's birth. And when the Vinda mountain got to know that the daughter of the mountain Himalaya, Parvati, got married to Lord Shiva. Then he decided to have a daughter that would be married to a personality who is even greater than Lord Shiva. Personalities, people, do get involved in such transcendental competition. Oh, Shiva's daughter got married to uh, uh, Himalaya's daughter got married to, part, to Lord Shiva. So I must get a daughter who will get married to a personality who is, who is even greater than Lord Shiva. So who is greater than Lord Shiva? Krishna. So with this desire, Vinda performed great austerities for many, many years. And as a result of that austerity, he was blessed with two daughters. And at that time, the demon Putana was killing all the children. So Putana's business was to kill children. Putana was very fond of drinking the blood of newborn babies. So Putana uh, stole these two newborn babies and she was flying through the sky. And the Binder's priest, seeing that Putana became, Putana stole those two babies, baby girls, started to chant the Rakshashi Nithani Mantra, the mantra that kills a Rakshashi, a demoness. And due to the effect of the mantra, Putana's life was in distress. So Putana became so afraid that she dropped these two babies and somehow ran away from them for her to save herself. These two baby girls fell on the river Jamuna when Putana let them go. And they were floating through the river. And King Brishabhanu found this one girl, one of those two girls, and King Chandrakhanu found the other girl. So the one that Brishabhanu found is Sri Radhika, and the one that Chandrakhanu found was Chandrakhanu. So, Sri Rupa Goswami gave this account of Radharani's birth in a book called Lalita Mata. And then King Brishabhanu started to bring up this girl along with his wife, Kirtida. His wife, Kirtida was very surprised to see that although this girl was so beautiful, she had been blessed with such a beautiful girl, but this girl was blind. And she was very heartbroken. But King Rishabhanu consoled her, saying that whatever happens is due to the divine arrangement of the Supreme Personality of God. Therefore, we must accept it, accept it as His mercy. So, <coughs> in this way, Kirtida Sundari was consoled by King Vishwam. And 
everybody got to know that Kirtida gave birth to a daughter. And although this daughter was so beautiful, but she was alive. So they also consoled Kirtida. What to do? After all, you got her such a beautiful daughter. She is blind, so what can be done? After all, the Lord has blessed you with such a beautiful daughter. Then getting this news that Kirtida gave birth to a beautiful little daughter, the queen of Nanda Maharaj, who is also a friend of Kirtida Sundari, came to see her along with his little boy, Krishna. At the time, Krishna was just crawling. He couldn't quite walk. But with, the, with some support, he could stand up. So, <clears throat> Kirtida and Jasuda were talking, just like when two friends meet, they discuss. So they were discussing, they were talking. And in the meantime, the baby Krishna started to crawl and crawled all the way up to the bedroom where Srimati Radharani was kept in a beautiful golden basket. And out of curiosity, he just stood up holding on to the side of the basket and he just looked in. And as soon as he looked in, the lotus-like eyes of this beautiful daughter, Srimati Radharani, opened up. So Radharani, after her birth, didn't actually want to open her eyes because she didn't want to see anyone but Krishna. All she wanted to see was Krishna and until Krishna came, until she had the opportunity to see Krishna, she kept her eyes closed or she pretended as if she was blind. And then uh, looking for Krishna where Jasuda and Kirtida came running uh, into the room where Radharani was kept in a basket. And they found that Krishna was looking into Srimati Radharani's eyes. And Radharani's eyes, beautiful eyes, opened up like two fully bloomed lotus flowers. And in this way, Radha Rani made Krishna. Srimati Radharani <coughs> was born in a place called Javat, in the mountain where King Vrishokhanu had his palace. His palace is still there, which is known as Varsham. The word Varshana is in this way connected to the Vishnu. In Varshana, Srimati <coughs> Radharani started to grow up along with her cowherd girlfriends headed by Lalita and Vishakha. And Krishna was also growing up in Vrindavan in the house of Nanda Maharaj. Radharani was very expert in all kinds of household chores, especially in cooking. And one day, Sage Durvasha came to the house of King Vishnu. King Rishabhanu received him with great care and 
he appointed Radharani to take care of the sage. And Radharani took care of Durvasha so nicely that Durvasha blessed him, I'm sorry, blessed her that whatever she cooks would taste like meat. And Mother Jashoda got to know about that benediction. And since she wanted to offer the best to Krishna, she arranged that Radharani would cook for Krishna every day. So that is how Radharani used to come to the house of King Nanda Maharaj and Mother Jashoda to cook for Krishna every day. And Radha and Krishna became very, very attractive towards each other. Radha and his complexion is like molten gold, and Krishna's com complexion is like the blue of the monsoon cloud. And they became so attractive to each other that Radharani used to wear it, uh, the color of sari, the color of, like that of Krishna's body. And Krishna started to wear his dhoti the in the complexion of Srimati Radharani. Krishna wears a yellow silk dhoti and Radharani wears a blue sari. That is, <coughs> Radharani is uh, always dressed in that color. And Krishna also uh, dressed in his yellow dhoti. Pahirana pita patambara sohe nupura yunushun charana. Pita means blue. Uh, pita means yellow. Pita patambara, pat ambara. A pot means silk, umber uh, is a cloth. So Krishna wears the Krishna wears the cloth. Krishna the, the cloth that Krishna wears has the color is made of silk and has the color yellow. And <coughs> Radharani, uh, sar, the color of Radharani sari is bluish. Nilambara. And Radha and Krishna became extremely attractive to each other. Radha could stay without Krishna, Krishna could stay without Radha. And their friends got to know about that. And that's why Krishna's friends always try to bring Krishna and Radha together. And Radha's friends also always try to bring them to that. In this way, all the cowherd boys and cowherd girls in the group of Krishna and Radha always try to unite Radha Krishna. In Vrindavan, when Radha and Krishna are together, that is that causes the greatest ecstasy in the hearts of the associates of Radha and Krishna. And when they are separated, they are always making attention how to bring them together. Now as they were growing up, in India as you know, the, the boys and girls get married very young. Especially the girls at the age of six, seven, or eight, they get married. And of course, it may sound very strange, but actually, it is very really good. Because the woman's psychology is as such that whoever she falls in love, the first love, completely fills up the emotions of her heart. Like the first love for a woman is 
everything. And in the Vedic culture, it was considered that a woman, that a girl, before she reaches her womanhood, should be obsessed or should be absorbed in the thought of the man that she belongs to. Another understanding of the Vedic culture is that a girl is considered to be the property of the husband. A girl is not the property of the parents. Son is, but not a daughter. A daughter is consider considered to be the property of her husband. And the parents are the caretakers. From the birth onwards, the parents actually take care of the daughter to offer her to the husband in due course of time. Just as a caretaker in due course of time offers the property to the rightful owner. So it is actually, she is actually the property of her husband. So the parents used to be very concerned that uh, she is offered to the right person, the right full proprietor. And so that's why they always considered that offer her to, to be able to offer the girl to her husband is the most important person. And it is not that, that when they were married, right away they used to go to the husband's house. They used to get married, the girl used to get to know that she is married, and then she would continue to stay in her parents' house until she grew up, until she reached her early youth. And then she went to the husband's house to be with him. So the custom is there in the Vedic culture that a daughter is married at a very young age. And by the divine arrangement of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, assisted by assisted by Purnamasi, Jogamaya, who actually makes all the arrangements for the pastimes of the Lord. Radharani was married to someone else other than Krishna. Why she was married to someone else other than Krishna has also been described very elaborately. She was married to Abhimanyu. He was also a very wealthy cowherd leader. He was also a prince. Now, why Radharani had to be married to someone else other than Krishna has been described in this way. That in Vrindavan, the meadow or the loving relationship is in parokya rash. Parokya means loving relationship between two unmarried persons. A girl is not married to the lover. And that is considered to be the most intense loving relationship. In marriage, husband and wife tend to take each other for granted. So although in the beginning there is a lot of excitement, but that excitement subsides after the wife. They become, they, they, they begin to take each other for granted. But when there is a loving relationship, between a man and a girl who is not married to her, 
then that, then that loving relationship is full of excitement. Now, <clears throat> is this a mundane love affair, the relationship between Radha and Krishna? No. It is absolutely spiritual. And this relationship is actually topmost relationship of the spiritual sky. And this material nature, or rather a woman who is married to somebody else, is considered to be the most abominable relationship, isn't it? In the material nature, when a man and my has a relationship with somebody else's wife, that is considered to be very, very sinful or very degraded, very abominable. Why? Because that is the purported reflection of Krishna's relationship with the Gopi. In the material platform, that relationship is abominable. Why? Because it is immoral. Now, the relationship with Krishna and the gopis, is there any question of immorality? No. Because Krishna is the supreme proprietor. Krishna is the proprietor not of not only the gopis, Krishna is also the proprietor of the husbands of the gopis. So where is the question of immorality? And besides that, <clears throat> the relationship between Krishna and the gopis is not physical, it is spiritual. It's absolutely spiritual. There is no tinge of any material lust there. Krishna doesn't have a material body. Shrimati and the gopis of Vrindavan also do not have material. They are completely spiritual. Krishna's body is completely spiritual. The Gopi's body are completely spiritual. Oh, Krishna, 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 Before we approach this subject matter of 
Krishna's relationship with the gopis. <coughs> when Krishna <coughs> dances with the gopis, just by hearing about their pastimes, one becomes a brahmachari. Isn't it? <laughs> like we got to know about Krishna's, we became Krishna consciousness and we gave up material attraction. So much so that we left our home and we moved into the temple. And in the temple, in Krishna consciousness, in the society of Iskand, the relationship between the husband and the wife is a spiritual relationship. And in this relationship, even the householders are Brahman. Prabhupada said in Iskon, not only the Brahmacharis or Sannasis or Vanaprasthi should be Brahmacharis, but even the householders are Brahmacharis. And that is when the householders indulge in their relationship for the sake of procreation, that is also selfless or brahmacharis. And that's why there is so much emphasis on relationship between husband and wife only for the sake of procreation, not for sense gratification. Lust means sense gratification. A man-woman relationship, sexual relationship, is lust. But when <clears throat> there is a consideration of duty, procreation is a consideration of duty. And that is, that purifies that act of apparent lust. So much so that Krishna said that this relationship between husband and wife for the sake of procreation is he himself. There is nothing immoral or abominable in that. But when it is for the sake of sense gratification, then yes, it is immoral. And those who want to make spiritual advancement must refrain from this act. Now the question actually arises that in order to enter into the spiritual sky, one has to become a brahmacharya. Unless and until one has conquered sex desire, one cannot enter into the spiritual sky. Then how is it possible that the highest act of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which is eternal consort, is sexual. No. It is diametrically opposed to the sexual relationship. When one, in order to enter into the spiritual sky, has to become, has to conquer sex desire, then how can there be sex life in the spiritual sky? Isn't it common sense? Therefore we have to understand that there is no tinge of sex even in the relationship between God and And that has been very wonderfully displayed time and time again in the relationship of Krishna with the gopis and Brahma. Therefore, we have to treat this back very, very carefully. In a later part of the day, we will discuss more on this topic, about Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, rather than his pastimes of Krishna in Vrindavan. And just one more point I want to make here before ending this class is that This apparent uh, arrangement is there that Krish, Abhim, Krish, Radharani is not married to Krishna but married to Abhimanyu. 
is simply in order to intensify the love between Krishna and Krishna. Actually, love, the more obstacle is there, it is said that the love becomes more intensified. The more obstacles are there, the more is the hankering to become united with each other. And these are these obstacles arranged by Jogu. And <clears throat> from the, uh, the question of the morality also can come in here, that after all Krishna is setting a wrong example. Krishna is having an affair with somebody else's wife. <laughs> Krishna in Bhagavad Gita he said, Janja Rachara Krishna's Lokasar Anubartati. Just as a great personality acts and the common man follows, so should the common man follow this act of Krishna also, Krishna's loving relationship uh, with others' wives? No. And in order to prevent uh, that mentality, we have to have the proper understanding and that understanding is that when uh, the gopis came to the marriageable age, Krishna proposed to Nanda Maharaj that, that this girl should get married. And that was actually the year when Brahma stole the cow from her and kept them locked up in the cave. So that year what happened? For one full year, Krishna expanded himself into all the cow And that is the year uh, when all the gopis got married. <laughs> so who did they get married to? They got married to Krishna. <laughs> So, even from the morality point of view, we can see that there is all these pastimes are spotless. So, and another consideration is that although Radharani was married to Abhimanyu, Abhimanyu uh, was a cleaver. Cleaver means a mute. He was neither a man nor a woman. So uh, she, Abhimanyu, by the element of divine nature, could not have, did not have any relationship. And all the outer boys uh, could not actually, did not actually touch their wives. They were their wives, but they didn't have any relationship. All the relationships they, all these girls had, was only with Krishna. So <clears throat> these are the top, sick, top most secret of the spiritual sky. That's why we find that even Sukadev Goswami is not uttering the name of Shri And finally, when he did that, he did it in an indirect way. So Sukadeva Goswami, we can consider Sukadeva Goswami is a perfect Brahmachari, Naishtiki Brahmachari. So much so that uh, Sukadeva Goswami, right after his birth, just walked out of his father's house and went straight into the forest. He was so, he was such a Brahmachari, he was so detached from all material activities that although he was walking, walking naked and he was a fully grown youth at that time. And the celestial damsel, the Apsaras, were bathing in Mandakini at that time, in the celestial river. And when they saw Sukadeva Goswami walking naked, they did not feel any shame or embarrassment being naked in the water bathing. Whereas when Vasudev came, they became perturbed. And they immediately came out of the water and covered themselves with their clothes. 
So this personality who is so uh, who is so detached, who is such a perfect brahmacharya, why is this personality describing Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan? If that pastimes had any immortality in it. So that is another point whereby we can see that these activities of Krishna with the gopis is perfectly transcendent. And in order to approach those topics, these subject matters, we must approach very, very carefully without a tinge of lusty desires in our hearts. And it is said that these pastimes of Krishna with the gopis is so wonderful that just by hearing about those pastimes, one becomes free from lusty desires. The hearts become free from lusty desires. That is why Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu revealed the pastimes of Radha Krishna in this age of Kali where people are naturally very, very dedicated. Mahaprabhu is giving us the mercy of Vrindavan. In the mood of Srimati Mataraji, he is offering the loving relationship with Krishna. And this movement, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, is meant to cultivate that relationship. Hare Krishna. All glory is to show to the Father. Does, one, does anybody have any question? Yes.